in the Red Lion case, but that was back in 1969. <clears throat> and it was, if you read the decision, it was determined uh, uh, and predicated on the existence of a specific set of public interest threats. The key concern that the court identified, and most people say spectrum scarcity, but instead what the court really talked about was a concern that a very, and I'll quote here, a very small number of licensees might monopolize the marketplace of ideas in a way, as the justice put it, would usurp the right of people to receive suitable access to social, political, aesthetic, moral, and other ideas and experiences. But ladies and gentlemen, today's technologically advanced and intensely competitive electronic marketplace with so many informational and, and educational outlets, including, as I mentioned earlier, the internet, seems to me that the concerns expressed by the High Court in Red Lion are no longer even remotely realistic. And indeed, I think it's fair to say that no other society in the history of the world has ever enjoyed such a diverse, vibrant, and rich media environment today, both electronic and print. And in these circumstances, I think it's prudent for the FCC to keep in mind the old axiom that where well, you've got a regulation that might be legitimate in the face of a given problem, if that problem no longer exists, the regulation is perhaps not at all acceptable. I think this is one of these relatively rare cases that come along in which government officials would do the right thing by doing nothing at all. For a long time, the Fairness Doctrine has been sound asleep. And my view and advice is, let it rest in peace. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank, thank you, Rich. We really appreciate that presentation. And uh, Mr. Jerry Fritz, please. Well, you know, I, I always love following my friend Dick Wiley. He was my inspiration uh, to uh, get into the communications field. This is my 41st year in and around television, and uh, it seems to me I'm always in Dick Wiley's shadow. Um, it's been said that the effectiveness of the Sword of Damocles is not that it falls, but that it hangs. The goal of the Fowler administration at the FCC in the early 1980s when I was chief of staff was to cut the horsehair that supported the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, that was the sword that we sought to get rid of in the name of the First Amendment. Its impact was stifling and we set out to get rid of it. It'll be four decades this year since the Supreme Court ruled on the Fairness Doctrine in the controversial Red Lion case that Dick mentioned. We thought we had offed it 22 years ago. Uh, the question is, does anyone have a wooden stake for this zombie of a policy? <laughs> Let me set the stage. Dick did a terrific job. The origins of the Fairness Doctrine lie in the FCC's report on editorializing by broadcast stations that was issued 60 years ago this year. Over time, the doctrine evolved into these two primary elements that Dick mentioned. Stations had to cover controversial issues, and number two, they had to give a right of reply to the other side, even if that right had to be free. Those were the two elements. The problem arose from the federal enforcement based upon the challenges to FCC granted licenses, and those were granted at the time every three years. You had to come in for renewal, and people could petition to deny your license. When Dick was chairman 35 years ago, he gave a speech that I recall to the Ohio University in which he noted there had been 2,500 Fairness Doctrine complaints filed in 1973. 2,500 is sort of as reminiscent of indecency complaints today. That resulted in 109 formal rulings. You sort of wonder what happened to the other 2,391. My guess is lots of broadcasters, as Dick alluded to, went scurrying to show the other side, lest they spend any more money on lawyers. Former FCC commissioner, a friend of Dick's and mine's, Glenn Robinson, who's now a professor down at the University of Virginia, aptly called it interim control. When the constitutionality of the doctrine was challenged in 1969 in the Red Lion case, the Supreme Court relied very heavily on the FCC's promise that the net effect 
of the doctrine was to increase coverage of controversial issues, increase coverage. As if inviting reconsideration based on new or better data, the court added, quote, if experience indicates that the doctrine has the net effect of reducing rather than enhancing the volume and quality of coverage, there will be time enough to reconsider the constitutional implications, end quote. Well, Chairman Fowler accepted the invitation. In its 1985 Fairness Doctrine report, the FCC found that the net effect of the doctrine was not to expand coverage at all of controversial issues by broadcasters, but reduce it, creating a chilling effect on speech which was protected by the First Amendment. The Commission's report also documented explosive media growth and questioned the scarcity rationale that underlies, underlies content regulation. Nothing Nothing in the world is available in limitless quantities. Not land in New York City which would justify content controls of billboards or trees for newsprint uh, condoning regulation of newspapers. With the advent of cable and satellite television, not to mention the unknown internet at the time, there was every reason in 1985 to point out that scarcity was a question of law, not a, 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 I'm sorry, a question of fact not a question of law as it was determined in Red Lion. The Red Lion scarcity premise was sand foundation that was eroding. About this time, Meredith Broadcasting, the owner of a television station in New York City, was found to have violated the Fairness Doctrine by running a paid ad advocating construction of a nuclear power plant. The station declined to run a piece opposing construction. In its court challenge, Meredith essentially argued, why is the FCC enforcing a doctrine it believes disserves the public interest and is probably unconstitutional? The D.C. Court of Appeals unloaded on the FCC for ducking the constitutional issue. Although both houses of Congress had by then voted to codify the Fairness Doctrine into law, a veto by President Reagan put the issue back on our plate. We took the court at its word and decided to finally abolish the doctrine. In May of 1987, Chairman Fowler had announced his intention to finally leave the FCC after serving longer than any chairman in history, and I convinced him to let the new chairman, Dennis Patrick, preside over the doctrine's demise, arguing that everyone would know it was Mark's work, but to let Dennis begin his, administ his administration on a high note. The day after the commission ruled, all hell broke loose. House Chair Commerce Committee Chairman John Dingell held a press conference to call us all lickspittles. Senate Commerce Chairman Fritz Hollings called us wrongheaded, misguided, and illogical. And then it got ugly. <laughs> Oversight hearings were held, investigations were conducted, motives and processes were questioned. But in the end, the Congress found that it that um, the four FCC commissioners had complied with a court order to resolve a constitutional challenge to one of their own regulations and that in doing so they had essentially voted their conscience. The offspring of that decision, conservative radio hosts Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, Neil Bortz, Ann Coulter, Michael Savage, Bill O'Reilly, Glenn Beck, and liberal hosts, Rachel Maddow, Al Franken, Randy Rhodes, Ed Schultz, Stephanie Miller, Bill Press, Alan Combs, on and on. Hopefully, that's the wooden stake that we are all looking for. But as Tom said, stay tuned. There may be more to come. Well, I appreciate those presentations, gentlemen. Thank you very much.